So chapter one. All right, so one thing you, as a reminder too of what heat transfer is, because I know people get mixed up with temperature and heat transfer and temperature is not heat transfer. Um, heat transfer is thermal energy in transit. So let's you know, move in due to a temperature difference. So the temperature difference is the driving force, but temperature itself is not heat transfer, right? If everything is at a thousand degrees Kelvin, let's say there's a high temperature, but there's no heat transfer through that thousand degrees cell Kelvin, because if it's all thousand degrees Kelvin, there's no difference or driving force for heat transfer, okay? So that just means it's a thousand degrees Kelvin. That's just temperature, okay? Um, thermal energy, right, is uh, associated with, you know, basically it's the translation, rotation, vibration, you know, and states of the atoms and molecules, and, you know, internal energy is thermal energy, okay? And so, and there's kind of a link to temperature of the matter, okay? But they're not, they're, they still have different meanings between thermal energy, temperature, and heat transfer, okay? All right, so here it kind of shows some of the main symbols, and we'll go through more as we go through the chapters, right? So thermal energy, right? We have capital U or lowercase u, which is per kilogram, okay? Temperature, nice and easy, is capital T, right? And heat transfer, right? So our different forms of heat transfer down here, or different symbols, I should say. We have heat. So just the quantity of heat over some time interval is capital Q, right? It has units of joules, right? Heat rate, which we saw in thermo as Q, capital Q dot, is actually lowercase Q within uh, heat transfer. Okay, so that changes. So you got to be aware of that kind of symbol change between the books. And the other thing that's kind of new um, that we really didn't do in thermo is heat flux. Okay, heat and then the flux term. And that's basically uh, the symbol is Q double prime. And that's equal to basically this capital Q, or sorry, this lowercase Q right here divided by the cross-sectional area. So you're basically dividing by the area because let's say you have a plain wall, right? Well, and you have heat transfer going through. Well, this area, this plain wall area here and in, you know, into the board is the same here where Q enters it as it leaves. So we don't really have to look at this um, heat transfer in Q, we could look at it as in Q double prime because the area is just the same. The cross-sectional area that it's flowing through is the same. So we could look at that cross-sectional area as kind of like a um, scalar term, right? If we basically want more heat, we just make take that heat flux and have a larger cross-sectional area. All right, so the modes of heat transfer, we kind of talked about them a little bit in Thermo 1 early on, but again, we'll talk about them again. We have conduction, so it's heat transfer in a solid or stationary fluid. So that means the gas or liquid is not moving, okay? Um, there's, it's, it's basically, it's bulk motion is stationary, okay? Uh, but when we talk about what's going on kind of zoom in on the molecules or atoms, there's random motion down there, okay? And that's what's occurring. So if you think of kind of random motion in this solid here, that's transferring that energy through the solid and that's our kind of heat transfer going through that solid, okay? Or stationary fluid. Convection, though, has that random motion in a fluid, but it also has bulk motion. Okay, so that means, let's say you have wind, if you're thinking outside, 
the wind is a moving fluid, that bulk motion, or let's say you have a computer fan that's creating bulk motion. Okay, so now you have some bulk motion plus the random motion of that fluid, and that combined is convection. Okay, so in this case, on the diagram, you see a temperature at the surface. The surface is hotter than T infinity. T infinity is just like the outside air far away from the surface so that you have heat flowing from that surface outwards to T infinity. Okay. Last of the heat transfers is radiation. Okay, Radiation is basically electron configuration changes. That's emitted energy emitted by matter, but it's using electromagnetic waves or photons. Okay, so you have this surface right here emitting radiation, and then you see this surface right here emitting radiation. So you have some heat, radiation heat transfer coming off of each of those. Okay. So even say you're if you're at a desk at home, that desk is has radiation emitting off of it. So any object is radiating some amount of heat transfer off of it. It just might be also absorbing the same amount of heat transfer so that you kind of get a net radiation heat transfer of zero so that there's basically no net so that means it's not heating up or cooling down due to radiation okay all right so one of the thing key things within this is conduction and convection they require a medium what does that mean so we have in conduction we have a solid right here for that conduction heat transfer to occur. In convection, we have this fluid right here, right, for the convection to occur. But if we were to put this plate that we see here and have it inside a vacuum, right, so that we are removing all this fluid, let's say that moving fluid is air, so we're removing all that air, so now there can't be convection. There's no bulk motion of that fluid, so there's no convection. So that means, you know, in a vacuum, you don't have any convection. Okay? But radiation doesn't require a medium. Okay, it still uh, transfers radiation. As you can think about the sun transferring radiation to the Earth, even with, um, you know, vacuum of space there. The so and it actually transfers the best if there's nothing in the way, right? So you know, radiation you still have to deal with if you remove the fluid. Okay. All right. So then we'll go through the simplest kind of equations for these different types of heat transfers. Okay. So we have conduction that we'll start off with, and that uses Fourier's law. Okay. That's the equation we'll be applying. For his law, we have a vector form being shown right here, where we have heat flux on the left, uh, we have our negative, okay, and then we have our thermal conductivity, which is a property of the material that this conduction is occurring, and then we have our temperature gradient here, okay. You can go through and cancel units to see that the left is equal to the right. If we take a simpler version instead of the vector term and simple, simplify it down to apply to this plain wall we see here, we have this plain wall, and it's one. We simplify it to just one-dimensional heat transfer, so it's just going in the x direction that we see, right? We have steady, so it's basically steady state. And then we're assuming constant thermal conductivity. So the conductivity, the material's con thermal conductivity is not changing as you go through that wall. Okay, It's the same value. So if we apply this just in the x direction for his law, we see the general form like that. We could do it if we were doing two-dimensional, three-dimensional, there'd be x, there'd be y, and there'd be z. Right. We could have dt dy, dt dx, or d, dt dz, uh, and have the, the three different directions. Here we're just looking at a simple one-dimensional. Okay, so that is our equation. Right, and you see this negative 
is there just like we have up here where it has that negative. Okay. Now we apply it, right? We want to simplify and use that dt dx um, and put what we have in dt dx and that would be change in temperature. So we have second minus first, okay? So we have second minus the first temperature and then the dx, right? And that's our dx is L in this case. All right, so then what happens for this next step is they just switch Instead of T2 minus T1, it's T1 minus T2, and that gets rid of that negative sign, okay? So be careful of that, because some equations, we can jump right to this. If we're just applying Fourier's law to a plane wall, we can jump right to that equation and use that version. That doesn't have the negative sign in front, and we're just like a T1 minus T2, okay? But if we're looking at an equation when we're using the general Fourier's law, like this one, and we'll use that in some chapters, right? Then it has that negative. So be aware of that, why that negative is there and not, just so you understand the difference when you see those two different equations so you don't get mixed up and just kind of throw a negative in there or not have a negative and, you know, have it when you should and shouldn't have, you know, just kind of those kind of things, okay? All right, so heat rate, we see uh, the flux times area to get our heat within the X direction, right? All right, so convection, so this is with our bulk motion, right? So there's velocity in a thermal boundary layer. So Newton's law of cooling is the equation we use. And this one looks even simpler than Fourier's law, okay? At least in this form, okay? We have Newton's law of cooling. It just has the temperature of the surface, okay? And then the temperature when we get outside our boundary layer of T infinity of this fluid, okay? And then we have the convection coefficient, H. So that's H now in heat transfer is not enthalpy. It's our convection heat transfer coefficient. So don't get that mixed up. Still, that's H is the convection heat transfer coefficient, okay? All right, so we have H and we look at that and what happens is this term H, we don't have the back of our book. Like with thermal conductivity of materials, we can go to the back of our book in the Fourier's law and look up for our material thermal conductivity. You know, there might be just one value or you might have a material that it changes with temperature. So knowing the temperature that you'll have, you get your thermal conductivity, apply it in Fourier's law. In Newton's law of cooling, that convection coefficient is the difficult part to solve, right? That's where we have our later chapters. In chapter one, they'll just give you this convection coefficient. In the later chapters, we'll be able to solve for those, okay? And you know that can change by orders of magnitude, which will change that H, that convection coefficient, which then changes your convection heat transfer by a lot, right? So that value is extremely important. Okay. And how do we get it? By understanding these boundary layers. Okay. And fluids, you probably used you know, solved and looked at the velocity distribution over a, over a flat plate, you know, velocity distribution inside a pipe for laminar and turbulent flow. And well, in heat transfer, that plays a role, but we also have, and you use the velocity distribution, you solved it from say, you know, Newton's second law or uh, um, Navier Stokes equations or something like that, looked at and applied. Um, the equation. Well, in heat transfer, we have a, in addition to the velocity distribution, we have a temperature distribution, okay? And the temperature distribution is from the conservation of energy, okay? The temperature distribution may 
have a similar shape, like an identical shape to the velocity distribution, or it might be different, and that depends upon properties. Because the velocity distribution is from your fluids equations for Newton's second law there, and the temperature distribution is from COE. Okay, so in that shape of this temperature distribution, really that slope right there at that surface is what tells us the quantity of the convection coefficient. Okay, so that's how we, and we have a few chapters on it later on, how we get and solve for that um, convection coefficient. Questions so far? Yeah, Professor, I have one. Um, so are we going to have situations where we have to deal with the convection heat transfer coefficient and enthalpy in the same question? Uh, possibly, but the, the, um, the symbols will change. Okay. okay. And you'll see that in the next slide. Okay, yeah, or you, you got to be very careful. Yep. Mm -hmm. Your next set of slides, I should say. Uh, heat. So here we have radiation. Okay, radiation, you know, they're showing you a very introduction to it here um, and a simpler version of it, but we'll, we'll go through it and you'll learn a lot more when we get to chapter 12 about radiation. Okay, and so in this case, we have in this surface, we have a surface being shown right here, and it's showing you having radiation emission from the surface, like it can be emitting from your desk, so your surface of your desk is emitting radiation. But there can also be absorption of radiation from the surroundings into your desk, let's say. So this is our irradiation that's coming from maybe the walls in your room, right, that are radiating also. And then what hits the surface is our irradiation, okay? But we're going to look at the case where it's all not the same. Your desk temperature isn't the same as the wall temperatures in that. So if you have them not the same, then you're going to have a net radiation. If all those temperatures are the same, then you're really not going to get any radiation that's occurring. Okay. Um, all right, so what's the equations that go with it? So for the emission term, E, right, we see that's our outflow from our surface. We see the emissivity times our emissivity, or, or sorry, times our emiss emissive power of a black body, or the perfect emitter is what that is, okay? So that means the, and then you see them simplify it here, because the black body or the perfect emitter is Stefan Boltzmann's constant, the temperature of the surface to the fourth, okay? So then your actual emission, is, you know, with the emissivity times the Stefan Boltzmann's constant temperature of the surface to the fourth. Okay, so the surface emissivity depends upon the material at the surface. Okay, it's a property that goes with the surface. Okay, and you can see this one goes from, it basically goes from zero to one. Zero means like zero percent is emit emission. One means a hundred percent is emitting. It's, then it's the perfect emitter. Okay. Depending upon what your device is or what your surface is or what you're looking at, maybe you want it to emit, right, and be as close to one as possible to get rid of heat, right? Maybe you don't want it to get rid of that heat transfer and keep it in whatever you're looking at. So you want your emissivity, surface emissivity to be closer to zero, okay? So it depends upon your application there. Okay. The Stefan Boltzmann's constant, you know, that always stays the same, and we'll see where that comes from in Chapter 12. Okay, so this is the outflow, right, right here, what's coming off of your desk. Say. Now we have what's being absorbed due to irradiation. Okay, so we have some amount of irradiation that's hitting the surface. So that's this, this G here. That's what is coming, and it's going to hit that surface. Boom, hits it. Right. Well, there's a surface absorptivity that goes with it, and that's a property of the surface. And zero to one, right? So if it's 
one, it's absorbing everything that's hitting the surface. If it's zero, it's not absorbing. So again, depending on what you're trying to do. Let's say you're a solar water heater. Right? You want it to absorb everything, but you don't want it to emit anything, right? Because you want all that energy to come in, but you don't want to get rid of it, right? Because you want to heat up the water, right? All right, so we have the absorptivity, right, zero to one. So then we just put those two together. So what hits the surface and then times that property of the surface gets you what is actually absorbed that hits it, okay? And then if you take those two, you'll get the net, and that's what you see here, okay? And also, some simplifications are being shown here too, is the special case of a surface exposed to a large surroundings at TS, and they're at the same temperature. So this is the large surroundings is right here, and it's all at the temp T surface. And then we have this plate or whatever here, and that has a TS. So this is temperature of the surface, and this is temperature of the surroundings, okay? So this surface right here is small compared to the surroundings, is what's saying. And when that happens, we can make some simplifications, and we'll see that here. Okay, and that's where basically we're going to take what's emish, the emission minus the absorption and put those two terms together. So if we do that, we're gonna look at the emission minus the absorption, okay? And emission, we already did our equation right here. Okay, and it's with flux. Right? And then the what's being absorbed is our equation right here. Okay. Okay. So we have those two. Well, if we have, we can still take this a step further, and that's what you see here. And that's because if we have, think of this as large surroundings all at the surface temperature. Well, then these, you can think about this as just then emitting, and that's what's hitting the surface down here. If the surroundings are then emitting, and we think of the surroundings emitting at like that, we can say, oh, what hit, what is ending up hitting our surface as G is then this term, okay? So if we then put that down here, we have this, okay? The last simplification we can do is this absorptivity equal to the emissivity, okay? And we'll, you know, in chapter one, we're going to, you know, be able to do that unless they tell us they're different in the problems. In chapter 12, we'll talk about when we can do that and why, things like that, and go into these, the simplification in more depth that you see here in the slide. Okay, so if we can make this assumption because of this small surface and large surroundings at the same temperature, if those two are the same, then we can just pull the Stefan emissivity and the Stefan Boltzmann constant out, and you see this equation right here for the, the net radiation. So when you see that equation, it already includes, you know, basically this is the emitting part and this is the absorbing part. Like it already includes both of those right here. Okay. So there isn't another one on top of it. Although this one is just throughout large surroundings. If we had, say, on not just that, we had like some heat lamps, say we had a heat lamp emitting down, that would be a secondary source of radiation. So that would be a separate uh, a source of radiation. You'll see something like that in the, in the example in a minute. Another thing you'll see every once in a while, not too often, is the radiation heat transfer. 
coefficient. So what they did here is just linearize this. Basically, they made it to be an H times delta T. So they moved around this equation right here, forced everything inside this radiation heat transfer coefficient, which makes that look like this. Okay, that radiation heat transfer coefficient equation is in that. All right, this is useful in some things, other things not. And that's because this is dependent upon the surface temperature. You don't always really know that. A lot of problems are actually trying to solve that. So you have to know the value you're already solving to use this. So this might be beneficial more when you're just trying to compare the radiation heat transfer coefficient to the convection coefficient. So down here, we have a combined convection radiation. So maybe you're trying to compare this age to this age. Or maybe in later chapters, there's equations that we derive that you can only use H and not the radiation terms that are to the fourth. So then maybe you want to put it into this form. Okay. One thing that you'll see is radiation kind of throws us a loop because it's to the fourth power. So that causes a lot of headaches and problems where it makes it difficult to solve lots of problems without, you know, numerical methods are sometimes the only process um, process to solve it if you have like convection and radiation because when something has temperature the fourth it doesn't really make it easy to solve for T directly and and we'll see some of that all right so an example okay So 1.63A, the number of panes in a window can strongly influence the heat loss from a heated room to the outside ambient air. Compare the single and double pane units shown by identifying relevant heat transfer processes for each case. Okay, so it's really just a problem where we're labeled. Okay, so the schematic is really the problem. Okay. So we have a room, and there's simplified things. We just have a single pane glass next to a double pane glass. Right? You, know, you have the, the sun on the outside, ambient air, room air. Right? All right. So if we just look at that single pane, okay. Well, on this side, on the right side of this single pane, we have room air, and the room air is moving. Right? So that means there's convection. Boom, we got convection on that right surface. All right, that means there's always going to be some radiation unless we neglect it, but there's radiation on the right side of the surface. Okay. All right, then there, through the pane of glass, okay, so through it, we have conduction. I know this label that they have shows conduction going. Way, way well beyond it to the right left, but it's only inside the glass there would be conduction. Okay. Then on the left side, we have the ambient air moving, so that'll have convection, where it changes to convection on that surface. Also, we have radiation that's occurring on that side because there's moving. You know that that surface is just there and it's always radiating. And then this QS is actually from the sun. So that's an external source of radiation heat transfer. So think of it kind of like a heat lamp that's there. Okay, and then you can have you know radiation transferring through and that's kind of what they're doing with this. So, you know, with glass, you can have some transmitted radiation which goes through the glass. But if it's something's opaque, not clear like glass, you could have a then the radiation doesn't travel through that material like in, in glass it does but let's say you have a piece of metal right it's, it's going to have radiation on the surface on one side and different radiation on the other side but if you have a piece of glass you can have some of the radiation that transfers through the glass okay all right double plane glass so the right surface right here has the same thing we saw on the right surface right here, and 
convection, radiation, and through the pane of glass, we have conduction. Right? Then we have between the double pane, we have convection and radiation, right? Because there's still some kind of fluid moving within the pane. Let's say it's filled with argon or it's just air. Then we have radiation to the surface, okay? Through, we have conduction, glass. And then on the left side, we have the same thing. Sun, we have convection on the left side. We have radiation on the left side, okay? All right, we might have had some transmitted radiation between them or through the glass. So with this double pane versus single pane, it creates more barriers, right? Single pane, you only have, let's say, if we're looking at the glass, we only have, we, we're just changing from convection and radiation to conduction and then back once. So you only have that kind of resistance of heat flow from that single pane of glass. When you have the double pane, now you're changing conduction, then you go to convection radiation and its resistances, and then you go back to another pane of glass that has conduction. So you have another resistance, so it changes the amount that gets transferred from one side to the other, okay, because of the extra resistance that you have of heat flow. All right, here is the same schematics, and you know they're just describing the labels like I did. Okay, so you can look at that if you want to. So 1.35. Was there any questions on 1.63 before I go to 1.35? Okay. 1.35 chips of width. L equals 15 millimeters on a side are mounted to a substrate that is installed in an enclosure whose walls and air are maintained at a temperature of T surroundings equal to 25. The chips have an emissivity of 0.6 and a maximum allowable temperature of 85 on the surface. All right, so then they give us a little schematic and then part A is if Heat is rejected from the chips by radiation in natural convection. What is the maximum operating power of each chip? The convection coefficient depends on the chip to air temperature difference. It may be approximated as H equals C times TS minus T infinity raised to the one fourth, where that C value is one is four point two watts per meter squared Kelvin to the five fourths. And then part B. If a fan is used to maintain airflow through the enclosure and heat transfers by forced convection, with H equal to 250 watts per meter squared Kelvin, what is the maximum operating power? All right. So we have, in more simplified terms, we have a surface temperature of 85, the enclosures, walls, and air 25. Part A is free convection, and part B is forced convection. All right, so the schematic lays this out. They give us, you know, the chip here. We have a length of a square. They give us the temperature of the surface, 85, emissivity, 0.6. We're putting in some electrical power into it, okay? They tell us there's radiation heat transfer out. There's also convection, okay? We have a surroundings, 25. T infinity 25. And then they give us two things, free convection, forced convection. Okay, free convection, or also natural convection, is when you have fluid motion, bulk, fluid bulk motion being created by the temperature itself, right? So if you have air, you're putting in, you know, a certain amount of heat into that air, it changes the temperature, becomes more buoyant, and rises, right? So that will create, kind of create a fluid motion, and that's called free or natural convection, okay? Forced convection is now you, you have a fan, and you're forcing air over it, okay? So they give us H is this equation for free convection, or H is 250 watts per meter squared Kelvin. When we get to later chapters for convection, we can solve for this H, okay? This one, they're just giving it to us right here, okay? All right, so 
some assumptions. We're going to say it's steady state. Okay, we're not looking at when we just turn it on, or just turn it off. We're going to, we have radiation, so, but we're going to just say it's a small surface and large enclosure, which it is, right? We have just this chip and then an enclosure. So alpha is going to, you know, our absorptivity is going to be equal to our emissivity. And then the other thing we're doing is neglecting any heat transfer from the back or the side. Okay, we're just saying it's all one one dimensional coming out the chip, on this, out of the out of the chip or in out of your computer screen, let's say. All right. So what does that mean equation-wise? We're just going to take power we're putting into it in some convection plus radiation. Okay. So that means we put Newton's law of cooling for convection there, okay. And then for radiation, we put our, you know, our equation that we derived for a small surface in a large enclosure, which has the emission and irradiation, what's leaving and entering, our net kind of radiation there, okay. Area we can easily calculate, since we have L is 15, it's square surface area. And then part A is free convection, right? And that's where they gave us this equation, right? So that means for H, right here we have this equation. Okay, so why you see this to the five fourths powers because you have H with one fourth here, but then you still have this T S minus T infinity. So if you put those two together, you get five fourths. Put H and this T S minus T infinity together. Let's show this over here. So H is in this case four point two or let's do C. Now we have area, and then we have TS minus T infinity again. Okay, so if we put the, all this together for convection, you see it's this combined equation. That's why it's the steps that's missing for all this together. Okay, so if we solve for convection, when it's free convection, we get 0 0.0158, right? Radiation, we have our equation right here. We given the emissivity. We give we calculated our area. Stefan Boltzmann's constant is always the same. We have the temperature of the surface. We have the surroundings. Okay, so we calculate it, and we get 0 0.065 watts. Okay, we add them together. We get this for electric power we can put in. Okay. If we have force convection, so now we put a fan on it. And that gives us a convection coefficient of 250. So now we get 3.375 watts, and we the radiation heat transfer doesn't change. We didn't change surface temperature, surrounding temperature, emissivity, area, or Stefan Spolz's constant. So that stays the same. So we're just adding that together, and we get a total of 3.44 watts. So we see an order over an order of magnitude change from free, free convection to forced convection. So you can see that means we can have a much more powerful chip, right? Because you know we can only keep it, say, at this 85 degrees Celsius because we don't want this the circuitry to melt. So there's a temperature limitation inside the chip. So maybe it's, it's 85 degrees Celsius. So if we want to have a more powerful chip, we gotta be able to get rid of that heat transfer in the forced convection raised it by a lot more. Okay. Any questions on that? Professor, can you go up one slide? Yeah. Uh, can yeah. you explain why the uh, absorptivity and emissivity are assumed to be equal? So that came with our 
uh, small surface and large enclosure. Okay, so so this. Okay, and let's say for right now, I'm not going to go into a lot of depth on that because it requires lots of slides and that when we get to chapter 12, we'll go into way more depth. But in chapter one, we simplify this a great deal. So if it doesn't tell you kind of in chapter one that they're different, we can keep them the same. We can say they're the same. So essentially that uh, assumption, uh, the assumption is an extension of the previous one? Yeah. Okay. All right. Yep. Thank you. So if we do the next set of slides here, and it shows. OK, so now it's taking, kind of showing thermo and then heat transfer and how we're going to utilize it a little bit within um, our heat transfer textbook. All right, so it kind of looks at a big picture, which is nice after having thermo uh, one and two, you can kind of get that appreciation for now a big picture of applying when to when you applied the conservation of energy. Okay, and we'll be using this still a lot in heat transfers, the, the first law. Okay. All right, so we had in the first law, conservation energy, we looked at kind of picking a time basis. Was it at an instant? Like, are we looking at rates? Like, at, at a single moment in time, are we looking at the rates that are occurring? Okay. Or are we looking over a time interval from a start time of zero and then an hour later, and the change in energy we had there? So, rate this in, at an instant in thermal, we looked at it a lot with, you know, open systems. When we looked at steady state problems over our time interval was kind of like when we were doing closed systems and we had just a certain amount of energy that went in it right and we had looked at the change uh, type of system so a control volume so we just picked say we had just picked a volume like this and we looked at what's going in and what's going out right well what's the new one in in heat transfer is a control surface let's say we had this as our object that we're looking at and we just want to do a surface so that means we would now just look at this surface so it's like an infinitely thin we're just looking at the surface of our system okay and you'll see in a second or two why that's what what's that what how that is pretty neat but then heat transfer allows us to solve problems and relate things a little better and why we utilize it. All right, within um, the conservation of energy at an instant of time, so we have our control volume, we have our instant of time. So here's our, our beam that we have our boundary around, right? And we have some energy going in, we have some energy leaving it, Right, and then the one we know about is this energy stored term, so that's the change in energy we, with respect to time inside our system, right? That's where we get to cancel that if it's steady state, okay? So that's our energy stored inside our system, okay? We have our in and our out. Well, we have this new one, which just takes what we might have said is in or out previously in thermo, and uh, for certain ones, and we call it generated. Okay, and what that is is if the energy is being generated inside our system. So, what's a good example of that? Let's say we had a, you know, we're looking at an incandescent light bulb, let's say, or a uh, space heater, and you have that wire, and it gives off a lot of with a light bulb, it gives off a lot of light, but also a space heater is just looking to give off heat off of that wire. Well, that wire has a certain melting point. Okay? 
it's trying to give off heat, but you don't also want to melt the wire. Okay, so maybe you're an engineer and you're designing that space heater wire, and you need to see if it's going to melt or not. So you have this wire, it's giving off heat. Well, we need to look at the wire itself. So if we zoomed in on this part and just kind of looked at part of the wire, this, and had our boundary, well, we have electrical energy being generated inside our wire, okay? And that would be considered a generation term, okay? So anything electrical, nuclear, chemical, that's being kind of generated inside our system is the generation term. We might have thought of those as in, in thermal one, like energy in or energy out. You can say it's an endothermic reaction that's occurring inside your system. That might have been energy out. We'll just think of those as energy generated. That's important in heat transfer because that changes some of the formulas we look at later on when we're looking at heat because it has generation term. Okay. All right, so so these are our good examples of it, okay, of generated. Otherwise, in and out would be heat transfer, fluid flow, or work. Okay. So here we see with rate, our conservation energy of N out generated, and then this is our stored term, okay. And over a time interval, so from one time to another, energy in, out, generated, change in energy of our system. All right, so in a transient process or closed system, if we're looking at you know, just heat transfer and work, if Q minus W, change in energy of our system, or if we're neglected potential and kinetic, like we did a lot in thermo, then this change in energy of our system just between delta U, right? At an instant, right, that would be rate. That would be the rate version, and you see how the Q changed to lowercase Q because it's not capital Q dot like we had in thermal. All right, so we have, if we're looking at an example of a steady state, open system, and then it's without phase change or generation, right? So that means we have mass flow rate right here, carrying in internal energy, flow work, and kinetic and potential. And we have mass flow rate on an outlet, carrying out internal energy, flow work, kinetic energy, and there's a uh, potential energy change. Well, like in thermo, at a, uh, we can combine the flow work and the internal energy into enthalpy. And here we see enthalpy, and we have a U, and it's a letter I. Right? So there's a change there. In that. And then they show us how we can simplify enthalpy like we did in thermo, right? Ideal gas. CP delta T, and compressible substance C delta T. If we had phase change, even though they're just looking at without in this case, if we did have phase change, then we'd have to look at the properties in our tables, right? All right, so here's the new one, surface energy balance. So here we have a wall, okay? So we see the wall, and there's conduction heat transfer going through the wall. Well, if we look at the boundary right on that surface right here, right, that means then on the left side of that surface is conduction, right? But on the right side, because this is open to fluid, we have, and surroundings, we have radiation and convection. But it's infinitely thin that we're doing our boundary, so there is no energy stored. Okay, so the energy stored term is zero when we're looking at the surface. Okay, but it allows us to equate the conduction to convection radiation. Right? The left side of the surface is conduction, right side of the surface is convection and radiation. 
So then we can put in our Foy's law, Newton's law of cooling, and our radiation equation. And this applies for steady state or transient. It's still zero for that stored term. All right, so a nice simplification kind of methodology if you're looking at conservation energy. You know, you, you did this a lot in thermo, but it gives a nice kind of big picture of it is, you know, schematic, making sure you're picking control surface or control volume and drawing your dashed lines, right? You choose your time basis. Are you looking at a rate based or are you looking over time, right? And then are you label your schematic, right? Put as much information on your schematic that you can, so then you can just you just have to focus on your schematic and not the word problem anymore that was given to you. Now you write your conservation energy, okay? The main form. Start with the main form and then simplify, right? And now substitute, right? Into the energy equation and then obviously solve for what you don't know. All right, example, I'll actually pause here. We'll do, there's kind of two examples here. Uh, there's not enough time to get through even the first one right now, but we'll do these two examples. And then we have, I think I have some examples that we'll do um, and walk through them for chapter one also. Okay, any questions? Actually, uh, I did have a question on the last slide when we're going over the methodology of the first law analysis. Uh, could you quickly describe time basis again? I'm not, I'm not entirely sure if you went over that, but uh, I was a little bit. Confused. Yeah, the time basis is, we go back right here, is our time basis that we're choosing at an instant, which is kind of our rate based. So we're just looking at, say, you know, at a moment in time, we're just kind of assuming it's steady state. So at that moment, it's we can look at a rate or over a time interval, right? Maybe time, we're saying from time zero to, you know, an hour later and looking at over this interval or we're putting in this amount of heat. So over that amount of heat, is some amount of time. Okay, so choosing between those two kind of time basis okay yeah thank you i appreciate that yep any other questions all right so then that's it for today we'll finish chapter one on monday okay and then you have an assignment already for chapter one, which you can get started on. You guys have a good weekend. If you have any questions, please let me know. All right. Thank you very much. Have a good day. Yep. You too. See you later, Professor. See you.